mind has two basic functions. On the one hand, it registers data coming in, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, thoughts coming in. And the other is that it, it wills things, it tries to exert an influence on things outside. You might think of this as the passive and the active functions of the mind, or the reactive and proactive functions, because even as the mind is receiving sense data, it's not totally passive. The willing function shapes the things you notice. And sometimes people complain about this, and this is one of the reasons why we miss a lot of things in our lives, because we're intent on something else. And that is a problem. But it can also be used to our advantage. And the Buddha describes dependent core arising. Well before he starts talking about sensory data, he talks about issues of attention and intention and perception. And these are going to influence the way you see and hear and experience things. And they can have an influence either for suffering or for the end of suffering. So one of the functions of the path is to learn how to take this willing side of the mind, the side that has ways of attending to things and ways of perceiving things, and ways of intending things, turn that into the path. One of the first things you notice as you meditate is the mind does tend to switch back and forth between these two functions, the function that's simply registering what's going on and then reacting to that, and the other side that's more proactive. And you can see this very directly in the breath. You could simply watch the way the breath already seems to be. Or you can put up a mental picture of how you would like the breath to be. Just, just a thought. Don't try to force it in that direction. Just have to think about it. Think about the breath coursing through the body. As soon as you breathe in, it goes all the way through the body, out to every pore. And then just hold that image in mind. And then after all, begin to notice which sensations in the body seem to be corresponding to that picture you have. And you can try encouraging them a little bit. In the beginning it should be just that, a little bit. Don't force things too much. But holding that different picture in mind helps you to read your experience in a different way, and also to shape your experience in a way that's more skillful. There may be a pain in the body in some place, and if you breathe in reaction to the pain, many times it just compounds the problem. I mean, this business of both reacting and then being proactive can get into some pretty nasty feedback loops. You feel trapped by a particular pain, and then you breathe in reaction to that sense of feeling trapped, and then it makes the pain worse, and then you feel even more trapped, and it just spirals down. Or you could think in other ways. You can see, even though there may be pain sensations in that part of the body, is that all there is in that part of the body? Are there other sensations that are not painful? And your proactive side of the mind begins to change the, the way you experience things. But in some cases, pain is a little hard to tackle straight on. So you work first with the breath. Just think of the breath going well through the body. Just think of the body as being light, filled with breath energy, healthy breath energy, luminous breath energy. And just hold that thought in mind. 
Don't be too impatient to see the results, because after all, the power of thought depends on a consistent, strong thought that you can carry on through over time. If you think a little bit and then scramble around looking for results from the thought, that's just a sign of impatience. And the thought doesn't have time to exert any power, any control, have any influence. If you learn how to th hold that thought in mind and then look very gradually to see if there are any sensations in the body that would correspond to light breath energy, full breath energy, free-flowing breath energy, then you can encourage those. And this helps you begin to see how, how much power the mind can have over shaping your experience. So you take the willing part of the mind, the proactive part of the mind, and use it to your own advantage. This is why attention appropriate attention is such an important part of the path. I mean, you could think about things in terms of who you are, what kind of person you are, if you're the kind of person who is lazy, the kind of person who never finishes anything, the kind of person who is always a victim of events. That just creates a vicious cycle. This is why the Buddha doesn't encourage people to think about what you are. He thinks about, okay, what's an action? What is a, re what is a result of an action? What is an, an intention? You can have all kinds of intentions. Free up your mind. There's lots of different ways you can intend to focus on the breath. To find an intention that seems to get good results. It may not be the sort of intention that your preconceived notion of you would ever think of, but why confine yourself? Why make yourself a victim? Why leave yourself in that position? You can be more proactive, learn how to be more proactive in a skillful way. After all the elements of the after all, all the elements of the path are fabricated. Your experience is fabricated through your intentions to begin with. And in the path, everything from right view all and down through right concentration, these are all fabrications. Right view, learning to look at things in a certain way. Learning to look for certain things. Okay, learn to look for some concentration, look for some stillness. Look for mindfulness. Their potentials are there. This is the, the Buddha's basic teaching on dhatu, or element or property. Their physical and mental potentials, just kind of waiting to be nourished, just waiting to be activated. But if you sit there as a victim all the time, you never activate the proper things. You activate all the wrong things. So it's not like you are totally passive. You are shaping events, but you're shaping them in, under the influence of a, an unhealthy feedback loop. So take the power of the mind that shapes things and use it for good purposes. Remember the kind of person the Buddha was. He didn't just react to events. He had a very strong sense of what should be. There should be an end to suffering. And he placed his conviction in that. And the power of his conviction made a difference. It reshaped his mind, reshaped his experience of things. Shaped his mind until it reached a point where it could see things very clearly in terms of why they're suffering and how you can put an end to suffering. It didn't just happen. It happened through the force of his will.
not blind will, but strong will. So put some conviction into the path. Put some conviction into yourself, realizing that you can fabricate the path in your own mind, put together all the various elements, the, find the potentials in your mind for mindfulness, alertness, concentration, insight, and develop them. The mind has a power. The problem is we tend to misuse it. We take that power and we use it to create suffering, even though we don't want suffering. We just get into reactive modes. Not realizing that we have the power to reshape our experience. Some people shape their experience in ways that are really harmful, but you can also shape your experience in ways that are conducive both to your happiness and the happiness of people around you, conducive to understanding, conducive to release. So learn take, to take advantage of those powers. Because that's the only way you're going to find your way out.